Remember, a Jew living in your wall is better than two Jews flying around with their bat wings, climbing down chimneys and eating innocent Nazis. Jojo Rabbit came out in 2019. It was written and directed by Taika Waititi. It runs an hour and 48 minutes long and you can stream it right now on HBO. Before we get into our review for this, I just wanna let you guys know that this is our spoiler review. Please stop if you haven't seen Jojo Rabbit yet. We're totally gonna spoil the movie. So check out the description below for our spoiler free review and you can watch that before you ruin the whole fucking movie for yourself. Let's get into it. Let's do it. Jojo Rabbit has a surprisingly huge cast. Taika Waititi himself, Scarlett Johansson, Sam Rockwell, Reek, Rebel Wilson, Stephen Merchant, and that cast is headed by some young newcomers, Thomasin McKenzie and Roman Griffin Davis, who plays Jojo, a 10-year-old blonde-haired, blue-eyed German boy growing up during the climactic peak of World War II. Jojo loves being a Nazi, just like all his friends surrounding him, because he looks up to and even imagines being best friends with his one true idol, Hitler, played hilariously by Taika Waititi. In Jojo's mind, Hitler is a sassy yet wise father figure who guides him through difficult times in the absence of Jojo's real dad, who he's been told is off fighting in the war. Everything turns upside down, however, when Jojo discovers a Jew hiding in the walls of his own house, and more surprisingly, finds out she's pretty cool. As Jojo actor Roman Griffin Davis puts it himself, this film is about friendship overcoming hate. Rather than walking a precarious line between being funny and being horrifying, Taika Waititi decides to jump back and forth throughout the movie between bits of slapstick comedy and scenes depicting the horrors of World War II, which Jojo is forced to come face to face with as he learns the true weight of his own decisions. Oh, and they hang his mom. Peach, this movie was super hyped up before we watched it. We heard a lot of people telling us to watch it. So you're up first, what do you think? Yeah, so this movie was very interesting. You know, obviously it's lighthearted, very visually striking, a lot of bright colors during what is very obviously one of the darkest periods in human history. And that makes you uncomfortable. And you're wondering how you're going to watch a movie that's almost two hours long surrounded by this discomfort. And that's the point of the movie. You know, that's where it tries to put you and tries to you know, change your perspective on that period of time so that you look at the themes and look at the points a little bit differently. Thought I did an excellent job at accomplishing that. I'll commend it for that. Some of the highlights of the film for me were Sam Rockwell. I thought his performance was amazing. You know, he usually crushes it, so I wasn't surprised. Any scene with Yorpy was just adorable. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that was easy laughs for me. Is that paper? That's what I thought at first too, but it's paper-like. It's the latest material invented by a top scientist. Great to see Stephen Merchant in anything. I'm glad he's in another acting role. You know, certainly does need the money, so thanks for doing that. Rebel Wilson also, I thought, crushed it in her performance. Oh, Yorkie, Yorkie. Great news, you've just been promoted and you get your own pistol. Just go and shoot anybody who looks different to us. Okay. Okay. Ah! I laughed multiple times during the movie. I thought it was funny. And it had some great lines. One of my favorite was when Hitler turned to Jojo and goes, Jojo, you're 10. It's about time you start acting like it. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Uh, also, the German Shepherds gag was yes. pretty hilarious. <laughs> so for the most part, I did like this film. But even though it was surrounded by all of these huge themes and it accomplished a lot of the things it was aiming at, after it ended, I didn't feel like it actually impacted me really so i felt like even though it would have been easy to hit on those themes it didn't so i'm taking points away for that it's a movie i don't regret watching but i'm not going to recommend it and i'm not going to watch it again this is going to get a 7.3 out of me Oof. what do you got al yo 7.3 that's like a little bit low i think i'm a little i'm almost a little a little confused about that i thought here's what i thought the first half I thought was pretty boring and slow. Like about uh, 50 minutes into this hour and 45 movie, I was kind of getting worried that the movie was just going to be kind of anticlimactic and lame throughout. 
But yeah, then but the second half was much better. Yeah, as soon as the scene with the inspector, Stephen Merchant comes in. Hello, Hitler. And they like look through all his house and then they also interact with Sam Rockwell and everybody starts meeting each other. It got yeah. way funnier. It turned agree. up the intensity. At that moment, the movie just started to become better and better until it ended. And uh, my favorite scene was actually the part where Sam Rockwell and uh, Reek are going, Alitla, 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 Alitla. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All the eight guys. Captain Klinsendorf. Heil Hitler. 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 You know, Freddy Finkel. Heil Hitler. 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 Their, their inflection and their delivery was so hilarious on that line. They um, were great. I also love their cartoon drawings of <laughs> their uniforms. And then the kicker at the end, that was hilarious. Oh, dude, and it had that, a lot of great parts. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, and I, I mean, as soon as the mom died, things obviously turned up from there emotionally. So not only right. did the comedy get better, but of course the actual drama you've been waiting for started to happen in the second half. Um, but it never got too intense. I feel like the emotional scenes were always padded on each side by comedy scenes. So you were never asked yeah. to like ball your eyes out and sit and think about any of the intense Definitely. stuff. But um, because I've seen more of Taika Waititi's movies, I'm inclined to think that that's probably intentional. He probably didn't want to weigh it down too much. He still wanted to kind of show you it through the eyes of a 10 year old, not through the yeah. eyes of an adult who knows what happened in World War II. Right. Um, so, so to me, the, the only con besides the first half being a little slow was that uh, the little kid who played Jojo, I thought, wasn't the best actor ever. I mean, he was no okay. McCoy Culkin. <laughs> I feel like you got to like him to like the film. I mean, no, pretty... I totally... Like, I, I expect him to become a good actor, but some of the scenes he was in, I felt, like, suffered a little bit because he wasn't able to show the emotional range that maybe a more experienced actor would. He'll get there. Okay. Well, it just took me out of some of the scenes. <laughs> no, I'm not hating him. I'm not hating him. I just say it, it makes the movie a little bit uh, not as I, good I as it could you. be. That being I said, you. I did like the movie. Mm -hmm. I might watch it again. It'd give me a while, though. Yeah, and I might. I, don't I would recommend it, so I'm going to give it an 8.5. Okay, that's good. It's solid. Are you surprised with my, my score? I'm a little bit surprised with your score. I think a low 7 is a little bit egregious. Don't you think you could have given it a high 7? I just He's only 10. He's only a 10-year-old kid, Peach. Why would you say those things about him? <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with anything. I just thought it was so easy for this film to score points. You know, there's big themes yeah. draped all over this film. It's a 10-year-old right. kid. You got Scar Joe. You got this amazing cast. So easy for this movie to be good. The concept is amazing. The lightheartedness, the set design. I mean, I, I'm i fucking up because I'm just naming all these awesome things about it. <laughs> but despite of all those things, it didn't accomplish anything, I thought. like No, no, I, I mean, I know what you mean by like it didn't. It, it didn't end with like a big punch in your face to leave you thinking about it a while later. Oh, I'm totally I over the movie. I hated the ending. I hated the ending. The dancing at the end. <laughs> the most awkwardest dance that ever existed. When they're oh doing my God. Like... Yo, that definitely <laughs> brought it down probably four points. And I'm not even kidding. If she said one different line, I thought she was going to be like, you have to live, Jojo. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I was expecting her to say that or something like they, that. They were obviously building up like, the dance. They were obviously trying to like, make it a hilarious thing. like, what the thing. fuck is this, Slumdog Millionaire? Get the shit out of here. I've <laughs> already seen this funny. once this year. You know what? I, I was kind of afraid that uh, Sam Rockwell's character and Rebel Wilson's character were just going to be these dry, one-level uh, comedy pieces. Like, Sam Rockwell's a drunk and Rebel Wilson's an idiot. And that's how it yeah. goes. But right. then in the, in the second half, and right at the end, when he comes out in the uniform that he had been designing, <laughs> I laughed so hard. I like wanted to stand up and clap. I'm like, this guy is now awesome. And of course, yeah. when he sacrificed himself to save Jojo and the Jew, oh, man. that uh, all of a sudden, he's, he's my favorite character. I didn't even care right, about him for the first half. And then he ended on the highest note. Yeah, no, that was cool. I like that. Yeah. What about everyone else? How, how did everyone else feel it, about it? Higher than us. The Rotten Tomatoes, the critics gave it an 80, and uh, the audience gave it a 94. I mean, that's not terribly surprising. I mean, it got nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, no, I feel you. I mean... Which I was surprised. Like, I watched I, it. I could see why it would have a Rotten Tomatoes score of a 94, but don't get it wrong, this movie's not a 9. It's not, no. like, it's not great. Um, the budget was $14 million and it grossed $90 million. Okay. Solid. Which, yeah, 
That's a pretty rock star return on a movie right there. Cool. What was the budget of World War Two? <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> uh, maybe we do a top five for like Hitler deaths in movies. <laughs> in Glorious Bastards is number when, one. Because when he got kicked through when he got kicked through the uh, the window, that was pretty funny. <laughs> by, by Jojo. I laughed out loud at that. Guys, as you know, every week we do a countdown of sorts. So this week we're going to do another Hollywood Top 5. To find out which JoJo Rabbit themed category we're going to do a Top 5 on, let's go to the Wheel of Categories. Kick it off. All right. You may think this list is funny, but funny how? Funny like I'm a clown, like I amuse you? That's Joe Pesci, and he brings us at the top of our list. Alongside Robbie D and close to Martin Scorsese, Joe Pesci has made a career out of being Hollywood's off the handle wise guy. From Raging Bull to Goodfellas, and don't forget about Home Alone, Joe Pesci has been making the audience nervous for over 40 years. Charlie M, ah. you make me pop your fucking eye out of your head to protect that piece of shit. Charlie M, you dumb motherfucker. Coming in at number four, we've got the man who invented podcasting, MMA, and eating elk penises. That's right, folks, it's Joe Rogan, the man himself who has gained more muscle than the amount of hair he's lost. This guy just made a deal with Spotify for $680 billion. If you haven't heard of this guy, then you never did DMT. Wow. It's a, just such a strange, strange concept. Yeah. Did you see that guy accidentally hit that moose with his car? No. Holy shit. Jamie, pull that. Number three on our list is Joe Nuttemaker, a.k.a. Joe Dirt. This rags to riches story is full of overcoming obstacles, including not having a fully formed skull, escaping from skin cannibal Buffalo Bill, and town bully Kid Rock. Not only did Joe not kill himself when he found out his parents were trying to capitalize on his newfound celebrity to sell clown figurines, but he also got the girl. What's up, Randy? There, look, I'm putting the lotion on the skin. I'm rubbing it in. At number two, you couldn't turn on Nickelodeon back in the 90s without seeing a commercial of this guy kicking some terrorist ass. That's right, we're talking about the American badass himself, G.I. Joe. This plastic piece of propaganda indoctrinated more children into the army than all the Call of Duty games combined. But wait, bonus points for the 2009 G.I. Joe movie featuring Joseph Gordon-Levitt as Cobra Commander, making it a Joe vs. Joe Joe down. Joe, Joe, Joe! G.I. Joe's gonna be awesome! Awesome! Before we get to number one, we've got a special honorable mention. This talented actor just missed the list of top five Joes in Hollywood. Coming in at an honorable mention, it's Jonah Hill. Sorry, Jonah Hill. Better luck next year. Ask Al about his wiener. And wait, another honorable mention to the second gorilla on today's list. We're talking about mighty Joe Young. All right, now the moment you've all been waiting for, coming in at the number one spot of our top five Joes in Hollywood. I know her, you know her. Let's face it, we all know her. She gets around. It's Joe Mo! All right, folks, we already watched Jojo Rabbit. We hope you did without watching this spoiler review, unless you're some sort of idiot. So what the fuck should you watch next week? Well, let me tell you, I've got a recommendation. My recommendation is Mr. Robot. It's a series. It's, uh, I think, four seasons in right now. It's on Amazon Prime. And I, I heard about Mr. Robot over and over again. He's like this hacker guy. He's Remy Malik. His eyes are wide apart. I like this guy, so I wanted to check out this show, and it fucking slaps. Definitely delivers. If you want an intense show right now, go check out Mr. Robot on Amazon Prime. Boom. In my queue this week, Peach, have you heard of this show? It's called Home Game on Netflix. Home Game? 
No. It, it's about these tiny little ultra local sports that are played all around the world. One of the competitions is these huge Scandinavian dudes who are trying to flip giant logs over. So I'm going to go check this show out. Cool. I heard it's actually pretty cool. awesome to watch these wacky sports. That sounds cool. Um, now for the better recommendations, my recommendations. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Something I can recommend is a little different than what we normally do here, but it is on theme if you're paying attention closely. It's not on Netflix, it's not on HBO, not on Amazon Prime, not on Disney Plus. It's on Spotify. And it's an oral history of The Office. So this is actually pretty cool. It's a podcast hosted by Kevin Malone, or the actor that plays Kevin Malone. And they talk about how The Office was made. Now, you're probably thinking, like I thought, I am I get it. The Office is popular. I've rewatched it six times. I'm good. I don't need to immerse myself in that. Well, it's more how does a show get made and how does a show stay on the air, which I think is very interesting. So if you're a fan of this this show, are you still watching? You're, I'm guessing you're probably going to like it because it's for movie buffs um, and TV buffs or whatever. Just buff dudes. Buff dudes like me. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Insano. Uh, Captain anyways. Insano shows no mercy. <laughs> <laughs> um, something that I have never seen before. In fact, I'm guessing you haven't either because it's not out yet. Is coming to HBO Max on August 4th. Oh, yeah. It's called An American Pickle. Starring what? Seth Rogen. <laughs> Seth Rogen gets stuck in a vat of pickles in a Brooklyn factory in the 1800s and no. is preserved for 100 years <laughs> and then comes back to life with to meet his grandson or whatever, who's Seth Rogen in the present time, and they get to, you know, hang out or whatever. I don't know. Wait, wait, wait. wait. So this is like a Seth Rogen and Seth Rogen type yes. Jack and Jill yes. type Medea's yes. House of Pain type show? Yes. Yeah, so this could be bad. Listen, it doesn't look that good, but it's Seth Rogen, so I'm going to give him the benefit guys, of the I didn't doubt. Ask watch PJ, it. Guys, I didn't ask PJ to tell me what he was going to make us watch for next week. I didn't, surprise. I didn't vet this, all right? So take it with a great. This is like Space Force. It's kind of like Space Force that PJ just couldn't <laughs> fucking wait to watch. Uh, I'll never hear the end of this fucking Space Force. All right, well, I'm going to go check out American Pickle in London. Yeah, you have to. And we will let you know our unfiltered thoughts. Yeah, I'm thinking top. I think we do a draft of Seth Rogen movies. Oh, I was thinking top five pickles. I don't really like pickles. Yeah, fuck pickles. This is an anti-pickle pod. All right, folks, we're going to do an anti-pickle show next week. And we're going to talk about Seth Rogen's uh, documentary about the day he got into a pickle jar. Hope to see you there. (laughs) What the fuck?